Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Debugging Yourself, Navigating Career Woes, Motivation, and Mental Health. If you're here, I assume that something is bothering you, but we'll figure that out later. Um, this talk is designed to help you with the process of what I call debugging yourself. So to start off defining what that means, in the context of this talk, we're going to refer to any dissonance or internal issues that you might be facing within your career or your work life. And that could be something like burnout, an overall lack of satisfaction with what you're doing, um, struggling with your day-to-day -day motivation and just like getting yourself to do the thing, imposter syndrome, or really any other experience that you're having that negatively impacts your ability to work or show up with a quality of life within that work. Um, so basically the human experience of work. And to start this off, we're going to take a little detour and dive into the approach portion of tackling these issues. Hi there. Hi. Um, to do that, we're going to start off getting a little bit nerdy about human behavior and function and the way that we approach our personal behavior and motivations. So, uh, a lot of us today, particularly within tech, a very logical field, focus on being humans that have a lot of thinking and logic with an inconvenience of also happening to have feelings about things. Um, and today I am here to talk to you about how in reality we are biologically driven by those feelings and our thoughts and logic help us interpret and move forward with them. So we're going to start with a little bit of a story. Um, hey, come on in. I can remember one afternoon sitting at my first agency job in Oomph. Anybody here familiar with Oomph? It's like a Northeastern agency. Yeah, that was my first Drupal gig. I learned Drupal there. Um, I was sitting at my desk and uh, looking around the room. This was like a big dev pit. It kind of looked similar to this room, a bunch of tables. We were all set at desk style. I could see like my coworker bouncing on his ergonomic ball in the corner. I had just gotten my coffee, like my whole station was set up. I had Sublime open. I'm still a Sublime user. I know a lot of people don't use that anymore, but I still do. Um, code was ready to go, local was running, had my coffee, and like nothing was gonna happen for me that morning. I just did not want to do what I had to do that day. I opened up my Jira issue lists and like nothing looked inspiring whatsoever. So I just like hopped over to Slack and, you know, uh, did basically anything except for the one thing that I was supposed to be doing that day. Um, is that familiar to anybody? Does anybody else have that problem? So you're like, yeah, you should show up and like nothing happens. Yeah. Um, if you're like me, that makes you feel kind of like shit. <laughs> um, I started to feel like really lazy and I beat myself up a little bit on those days. Uh, so. That's not a great feeling, and um, if you fast forward a couple weeks from then, you know, this happened now and then, a friend sent me a job listing for a developer position at Acquia. Everyone here is familiar with Acquia, I'm sure, hosting, hosting company, big one. They were looking for a front end dev to build and maintain Acquia.com along with their other marketing suite websites, and my internal gears started spinning. I'm thinking about how I'm struggling with the agency work here, and my brain starts to think that this is a really great idea and like I will love working on one thing at a time and not having it be agency style, not having to worry about logging my time, just focusing on one really great product and building it and I'm going to be the most motivated and satisfied person in the world working on this project. So I went ahead and applied for that position um, and I tricked them into hiring me. So that was great. <laughs> Um, a few weeks later, I take a train, I go up to Boston, I arrive for my first day at the State Street offices, which were the biggest offices that I personally have worked in. They had this fancy elevator system where like, you just scan yourself in and you have to get on the right elevator or it's not going to go to your floor. It was like a whole thing. For me, it was impressive. Um, my jobs here started off really, really strong. I was super excited by the gig. I like loved meeting the new people. Um, I took big ownership in the new website and the 11 other websites because their marketing team got a little bit excited that <laughs> uh, we had going on and things were going really well. Aside from 
exhausting amounts of travel, two ways in and out of Boston, two hours each way. Um, I was super excited about everything. I was showing up with a lot of pesto and, and drive in my work, and I was feeling really good about that change. Moved forward a couple of months, and I found myself in a familiar scenario. I would show up at that office, boot up my local, get ready to work, check the JIRA issue queue, and then I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. <laughs> um, start to you know, walk over to the really nice cafeteria that they had and get myself like a fancy hot chocolate coffee thing because they, there was just so many delicious snacks and ways to distract. They had a nap room, actually, which was pretty <laughs> cool. Um, so there were lots of ways to distract yourself at the Alcrea office, which was a blessing and a curse. Um, and, you know, it starts to turn back into a pattern. I start to see myself showing up this way and I'm not, not into what I'm doing um, as much. Like, it, it's... It's hit or miss. I don't do nothing, right? Like everyone has to show up and you get your job done and eventually the fact that you haven't done anything in a week will inspire you to do a thing, but it's becoming more of a problem for me to show up genuinely again. Um, so at this point, I start to tell myself that it's like something about this corporate atmosphere that I don't love. Like uh, traveling in and out of Boston is exhausting and there's... Uh, the team had a little bit of a ready, fire, aim sort of methodology to doing things that I did admittedly truly find frustrating. Um, so I started to tell myself that there's issues with working at Aquia, and I look for another position. And I take a job at a place called General Assembly. Anybody here heard of General Assembly? It's like a code boot camp school. They teach people online to become like a developers of different sorts. Um, I took a remote job there to help them out with their Drupal structure. And this is when I started to really find a problem because even in my first days at General Assembly, I actually couldn't find the inspiration to do really good work. I was like, I started that gig burnt out already, um, which was like a red flag for me because usually I get that honeymoon phase with a new gig where I'm like, oh, I love this. This is the most amazing thing. I'm going to do awesome work here and it's going to be super fun. Um, so that was, that was a little bit alarming for me and also the person that hired me got fired like two weeks later so that was a little bit awkward because no one else knew what I was supposed to do there. <laughs> um, so between my mix of not really wanting to be there and their having no idea why I was there, I ended up getting laid off uh, a few months later and um, I went back to contracting for my old friends at Acquia who always needed extra help because they have lots of stuff going on. So I'm back at contracting. I'm, I'm feeling a little frustrated in my career in general. I'm starting to feel like maybe I'm not supposed to be an engineer. Maybe I don't like web engineering, even though it's literally all I've been doing since I was 15. Um, I start to think about doing something else. And around this time, I also happen to be taking a lot of Pilates classes. <laughs> So, things are going really well with those, and I decide that I'm supposed to be a Pilates instructor. <laughs> and I went and I got my Pilates certificate, um, which I thought would be very simple, by the way. You know, you show up to like a yoga or Pilates. I'm sure you guys all do yoga and Pilates in this room. <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big crowd for that. Uh, I personally didn't think that there was a lot that went into becoming a, a fitness instructor in that way. Turns out I was very wrong about that, and I spent like literally thousands of hours learning this. But that's not the point. Um, I take this art on. Now I'm working part time as a Pilates instructor and still contracting for Acquia, so I'm doing both things. As you can imagine, teaching Pilates does not make nearly as much as software engineering, so that was an interesting choice on my part. But um, I start off teaching, and I'm loving it. You know, I really love watching someone get stronger and seeing someone like take on those physical challenges. I worked with a woman with MS and she had terrible balance and working with me, she was able to like get function back in her life. Super rewarding, like really awesome experience. Um, but I still find that, you know, maybe six months or so into teaching, I'm starting to dread planning my classes or asking someone to sub for me. Um, and I'm kind of hitting those same experiences with work that I hit with 
web engineering. So I'm like, I just don't like working, apparently. <laughs> Which, fair, I think. <laughs> but um, you have to work, so that was a little bit of a problem. <laughs> um, and then I was scrolling on Instagram this one night, and I came across a woman's post. Lots of fitness instructors go through Instagram to like look for workout pieces, something that you didn't need to know, but now you do. Um, and she had a course that she was offering on how to program a class off the top of your head, which I can now do if you guys want to do Pilates after this. I would be happy to teach you. Um, and it sounded like a dream come true to me because actually a lot of the time spent for a fitness class is actually just spent writing out what you're going to do. Um, so I was like, well, if I can just show up and teach off the top of my head, I'll love it again. It won't feel like a burden. Everything will be amazing. And I signed up to take this course. Um, I didn't even like really read it very much. I just like... That's all I needed to know about it was that it was going to teach me this magical gift and then I was good to go. Um, I showed up, uh, actually no, I got an email letting me know that the first group call for the course was in a couple of days and I was like, didn't know it was a live course, but that's super cool, I'll be there. Um, and then the first day I show up and what I thought was going to be a straightforward technical process related to that uh, class programming ended up being something pretty different from that. Um, our first day in class we did like a set of breathing exercises followed by a group meditation and then we shared like what came out of that meditation um, as a group and we're kind of doing like all of this introspective stuff uh, on learning about each other and ourselves and I was personally a little bit surprised to be doing that because I thought I was taking a technical course and um, not only was I surprised I honestly felt like a little bit weird because I don't really subscribe to those things usually um, they were stuff that, I mean it's not stuff that I have played a lot with prior to this experience meditations and things like that always sounded nice to me but they felt very fluffy and out there and I kind of felt a little bit like um, I was wasting my time, to be honest. Uh, so it felt a little bit annoying to me, and then I logged into the course material for what we were supposed to be learning in this course, and I found out that there was like a solid four weeks of us going through like a self-discovery <laughs> exercise before we even got to the part where I learned the thing that I wanted to learn out of this course. And unfortunately, it was like locked content, so like there was this online portal, and I had to go through the first four weeks if I wanted to get to week five that had what I was looking for. I promise I'm circling back to a point. Um, so I started to, you know, I, I had paid for this course. I paid a good amount for it. I wanted to get what I wanted out of it. So I decided to just go with it and I gave it a shot. Um, and I started to realize that with every passing week, logging onto these Zoom calls, um, getting more engaged with the process of understanding why I show up to teach, what I love to teach, who my best clients are, what makes me feel good while I teach, actually started to have an impact on the way I was showing up at work. Um, and the more questions I asked myself, the more connection I started to feel with my teaching each week and the less that I was dreading showing up at the studio. So my mind started to soften a little bit to the idea that some of these projects and exercises might have more merit than I had originally given them and for me this was this was actually kind of a big deal because I don't know what kind of households you guys grew up in but in mine we really didn't talk about feelings <laughs> like we were very um, logic focused families if I had talked to my dad about doing meditations or breathing exercises, he would have scoffed at it and, you know, told me that it was a waste of time and I should just suck things up and move forward and figure out what the next thing is. So this was kind of a big moment for me to say that some of these practices had um, actual effects on the way that I was showing up at work. I can easily say that I probably never would have signed up for that course if I had actually read the description and known what I was going to be getting into. But sometimes you end up where you're supposed to be. And I went through those 12 weeks looking for a way to make teaching my classes easier, and it turns out that that is actually exactly what I got, but in a very different way. Though learning the program off the top of my head was good. Um, 
Previously, I did not think that motivation for work was something that could be manufactured or brought within yourself. I sort of thought you had to just find the right thing that fit with your person, and if you had it all lined up perfectly in a row, you would be happy, you would show up, and you would get it done. And it turns out that that is actually not the case, and that the connection to your work and the motivation to continue to show up and do it and find satisfaction and passion comes from figuring out things about yourself and setting yourself up in a situation that does provide that success. So, um, happy ending. I, I did figure out <laughs> how to keep showing up at work. I now own and operate a Drupal agency called Mythic Digital. You guys might have heard of us. We are a sponsor here today. Um, and yeah, it was an eye-opening experience. So, it really led me to understand that, like, yes, we are humans with incredible amounts of logic and thinking and processing, but that underneath all of that, the things that still choose what our behaviors are are primal. And um, we have to understand the way we feel about things and be able to find those connections within ourselves to get stuff done effectively. So um, being the logical person I am, I wanted to understand this better when I started to find success with it. And I am a pretty curious person by nature. Um, I looked into some of the science behind the brain function that was involved here. This will be brief, but just to show you quickly, our emotional processes happen in the white part here. This is considered uh, old brain in, in the world of science. Um, it's the part that we share with a lot of other animals. It's been around the longest, and it's got this more like primal, instinctual part of who we are. Um, a lot of stuff goes on here, but what we're focused on is the memories, behavior, and emotions, keyword on your behavior. So this older, more central part of the brain has a really powerful hold on the actions we choose to take or not take. And then in the yellow part, up at the top there, is the new brain, um, which includes all of our fun stuff that we really love focusing on. It has the frontal, parietal, and occipital lobe, which is where we get speaking, thinking, reasoning, problem solving, compassion, lots of good stuff. Um, this part of the brain can help us interpret the signals from old brain or parts of our body about what's going on in the outside world and look at things at a more objective level. Um, as a society, and I think particularly within tech, we're pretty obsessed with the new brain, but it's new and it does a lot of good things, so it's not super surprising. Um, logic and problem solving and compassion are all super important. They move us forward. But as it turns out, we cannot function on new brain alone. And we have to continue to integrate with old brain and the part of us that still has driving factors for motivation and behavior within our bodies. So, um, quick poll. How many people here were like really taught to dig into their emotions and what they were feeling when they were growing up? Yeah, okay. How about, that really sucks. Uh, let's get some stuff done. That, that sound more familiar for anybody? Yeah, okay. So that was my experience too. Um, <laughs> I just like this dog. <laughs> These slides have almost nothing to them. They're just here for fun. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, as a reminder, you know, the root of this talk is supposed to be us saying, let's process, let's debug ourselves. And what I mean when I talk about that is like working through those internal issues you're facing in your career, similar to the issues that I was facing in my story, where like I was just having a hard time continuing to show up and, and do the things that I needed to do in a successful manner. Um, but it might look different for you. Like it might be burnout, you might just feel like you don't like what you're doing, you might have imposter syndrome that's showing up for you, anxiety, this could show up in a lot of ways and the processes that we're talking about could apply to lots of things. Um, however, to start this process off and to kind of connect in, I suggest that you check into what you're feeling. Um, and I like to consider that the human equivalent of a log. I don't call it an error log because some of your feelings are positive, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, today we're going to focus on the negative ones because we're talking about debugging yourself. So I'm going to assume that there's something wrong um, and we're going to talk about that. So how do you know when you're feeling a hard emotion? Actual question. How do you know when you're feeling something hard? What do you mean by hard? 
what do you mean by hurt? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> hard emotion. Well, I mean, it's got to be hard versus soft emotion then, right? So... Sure, you can think about it that way. I think about it like as a negative emotion is more of where I'm going with it, but yeah. I would think short term, long term, but okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's crossover there too, though, because you can have bad short term, you can have bad long term. Yeah, for sure. How do you know when you're feeling one of those? Mm. Well, I imagine a like a hard long term would be something that's been upsetting you for a long period of time, and Mm -hmm. then a short term would be something that's perhaps uh, more of a flighty. Thing. something that's bothering you here and there probably crops up well and that would be evidence of a long one in some cases depends on how long it persists I suppose but yeah yeah something that keeps popping up versus something that just comes and goes really quickly yeah, yeah, yeah and it depends on right. how much it repeats I suppose as to where it actually goes to, see how, it. to see how hard that is yeah. what else what else goes on with you when you're feeling a hard emotion in anybody sometimes you don't know that you're feeling it that's for true. a while Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it is a biological response, a psychosomatic response first, and then maybe you figure out if you're feeling something later. Yeah. What kind of biological responses do you feel? Uh, I don't know. Typical anxiety stuff or like when you get out of bed, crying. Yeah. Crying. Nervousness. Mm-hmm. Sweating. Sweating. Yeah. Frustration. Mm-hmm. Appetite. Appetite. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. I mean, th- these are all things, like you might shake, you know, your heart might race in some situations. Um, you might feel like, like a pit in your stomach. Like there's lots, of, uh, there's lots of things that happen in our body when we feel a hard emotion, which is part of the reason that we call emotions feelings because we feel them first, right? Blame's a really important one too. Blame? blame? Yeah, blame can be a huge indicator that something something is bothering you especially usually when there's blame there's shame of some sort you're feeling embarrassed about something um you're feeling there's something going on with you that's a great indicator that's a really trying to protect yourself yeah exactly um okay so imagine you're driving down a road and a deer jumps out in front of your car and you're able to stop at the last second nobody gets hurt everything's okay deer's okay what are you feeling in your body Probably. Adrenaline. Relief. Yep. Mm-hmm. What does adrenaline feel like for you? Oh, I do <laughs> <laughs> Specifically Mountain Dew. <laughs> the, the, your perceptions are more, like, the way you take the world in is a little more, um, heightened. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're like, your heart's beating out of your chest, feeling like a, like almost like a throbbing sensation. That's what happens for me, I think. Yeah. Very, very super focused on whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, different situation now. You're in the postmortem for a project. We all know what a postmortem is, I'm going to assume in this room. Yeah, retrospective. Yeah. Um, You're the main front end dev for a new project. You're new to this team. And you see in the fixed column that someone listed that the front end theme is really fragile, messy, and super hard to work with. <laughs> wow. What are you feeling right now? That's all, big. All the things. <laughs> all the things. Yeah. What, what, what things? Well, you're probably angry. You're probably maybe <laughs> embarrassed. Who um, said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like some more questions should have yeah. been asked. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. So how am I going to fix that? Are you feeling, is your heart racing? Maybe. Maybe. Are you feeling pretty focused on that situation? Like that has your full, your full attention? I'm sure dread is a big like, uh, Dread is good. Yeah, Yeah, and I think how we're feeling in that respect that situation can depend a lot on how much confidence we have as a developer, right? So like if you're new, if you're experiencing imposter syndrome, you may feel terrified in that situation. Also the team dynamic as well. Yeah, but you're new to this team, right? So you don't know the team dynamic super well yet. So we don't get into a lot of like real life danger situations anymore, which is great, but in the context of our workspace, that is 
about as dangerous as it gets for us, right? Like we have come up against a threat of our work survival and we have, we have to defend ourselves in a situation. Um, and what happens there is usually some form of adrenaline, um, some form of big response that can happen, you know, if you're not feeling, if you're feeling like a, a developer with imposter syndrome, you're on this new team, maybe you don't have a lot of confidence as a developer, if you react to the way you're feeling in that moment, which may be very defensive, um, you could have a pretty terrible response. Yeah. Um, so when we have the space and the practice to recognize when we're in hard emotion, when we make that a part of our day-to-day -day lives to say, I'm feeling really defensive right now. My, my heart is racing that means I'm feeling something hard and I need to take a step back and think about this and look at this objectively. You can tap back into, it's not there anymore, but the new brain part of your being and say, let's look at this objectively um, and have a better response than you might do if you just allow that old brain instinctiveness to come through and be defensive and attack the person who asked that really rude question in a really terrible way on the fixed column, which no one should ever write that, right? But um, they might and you might have to deal with it, and the way that you respond is gonna reflect on you, not on that other person. So, um, allowing our emotional state to overtake us might cause that to not reflect on us well, and um, we might not provide a valuable collaboration in that moment because we are feeling really in our feelings, feeling all the things, as you might say. Um, but if we can take that moment and recognize that we're feeling really vulnerable, we might be able to tap into another tool in our kit, and we'll talk about more of that today, and reassure ourselves that we did work that we're proud of, we showed up the best way we could, and that there's always room for improvement and there's room for discussion. Um, in any team setting, asking for clarifying feedback and being professional, especially towards someone who's not being professional, reflects really well on you, right? And so there's always an opportunity for us to take a better action, and that's how we can do that. So. To work on that process, um, we're going to talk a little bit about decoding those feelings now. Yeah? So, a hard emotion is your typical reaction? Not necessarily, but... Or like maybe your initial reaction? A hard emotion, I think, is so when different. you happen to have uh, something show up within you that does create those difficult feelings, like an adrenaline fight or flight response, an anxiety response. Um, this sort of reaction from your inner brain. Yeah. Your outer brain has to filter. Yeah, exactly. And in this case, it's something that's um, causing you threat in some way, threatening some form of your happiness, some form of your want, some form of your need. Yeah. Um, if you aren't used to identifying your feelings and getting in touch with them, which most of us genuinely aren't, um, it can actually be really difficult to start doing. But I have a few tips for you today on different approaches you can take. One of them is working with a journal. Another is guided meditation. Um, you can soundboard with a mentor, a colleague, or a friend. And I can already hear everyone in the room saying, yeah, I'm not gonna be doing any of that. <laughs> Um, but I just like, I get it, hear me out, stay with me, I promise, it's, it's useful stuff. Um, starting off with journaling, I like to consider journaling to be the emotional equivalent of the rubber duck method. Everybody familiar with the rubber duck method? Anybody not familiar? I can explain it. Yeah, we're good. No, you don't know? Okay, so the rubber duck method in programming, you know, um, if you've got a problem in your code and you're trying to debug through it, is you can use anything but for example a rubber duck you tell the rubber duck every step involved in doing the thing that you're doing and then you get to the step that you messed up and you're like haha yeah. um so emotional equivalent is journaling and um if you're anything like me the last thing you want to do especially when you're upset is start writing out like ridiculous messes of feelings on paper and like putting putting them to like legitimate words and having that be real, but um, something about doing that can make it feel like really permanent and exposed to the world and, and that I think can, for a lot of people, deter them from trying it. Um, 
do it anyway. Like, rip it up and burn it if you have to afterwards. But, and a journal is not like a long thing. Sometimes when I journal and work through something hard, I write two sentences down. It's not like an entire exercise where I spent my whole afternoon writing all of my thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams into a beautiful book. It's not like that at all. I wrote two sentences on a piece of paper about what I was going through my head in a moment. And when you write it down, you provide a lot of clarity around the thoughts that are rolling through your head. Because in our heads, we have this tendency to let things kind of like spin and ping pong and maybe it's this and maybe it's that and maybe I'm over here and uh, no, that's that can't be right. Like you just you do a lot of jumbling when you keep stuff in your head and if you just write down uh, something that you're thinking about you can see it concretely and you can respond to it and your new brain can have that opportunity to tap in and say does this make sense does this align what happens with this um, and by the way if you write something down and it doesn't sound like roughly like a five-year-old having a tantrum you're probably not being honest with yourself most of the things that I write down are ridiculous to be completely honest with you like they're borderline stupid but um that's that's the good part of it right because our brain does have these thoughts that really don't have good basis in reality or really just um they're not true or they they're a little excessive and, and you can't see it until you write it down on paper and you say oh yeah that sounds like crap actually so um Something else that you can do, especially if you're not sure what you might be struggling with, is a guided meditation. Um, I, even despite being someone who loved yoga and Pilates, firmly avoided guided meditations for years because, again, they felt like a waste of time to me, like sitting down for like 20 minutes or doing that. It just, you know, sounded lovely, but like it just wasn't for me. Um, but I have to say begrudgingly that they are, there is really something to them. They are effective. Um, when you're struggling to understand like why you are upset or what might be going on with you and you don't have anything to write in your journal, right? Like you just, you don't know why you're upset. And that happens sometimes. We, we are feeling a certain way about something and we just can't articulate what it is. Um, a guided meditation can be really effective in helping you kind of peel back some layers and find what might be going on underneath what you have. Um, the other part of a guided meditation that's really effective is that it usually has some nervous system work involved in it. Does anybody have familiarity with nervous system work in here? Say more. Say more what you need to So um, your nervous system, right, is the part of your body that's sort of in charge of whether you're in fight or flight or whether you're feeling safe in a given moment. And so there are a lot of situations, stressful situations in our day to day that can put us in sort of a tense position. Um, we don't always get like a closed stress loop on those situations. It's not like, you know, hundreds of years ago where you were chased by the lion, you got away from the lion, now your body's like, you're good. You're no longer in danger from a lion. The stuff that we have going on is really a little bit more permanent. So a lot of times, most of us have a little bit of stress that we're just carrying in existence. Um, nervous system work, there are exercises, movements, breathing that you can take that tell your body that it's currently safe. Um, so like the simplest one, something that EMTs use is called box breathing. Breathing in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold it for four seconds. Super easy. They use that to calm their nervous system down. When your nervous system thinks that you are safe, you have access to a lot better thought capability than when you are in that tense position. So, you know, an EMT uses it to keep himself <clears throat> or herself um, sharp at a scene in an emergency. And likewise, you can use something like that. And a meditation often has a breathing aspect to it, right? Um, to calm your system down and allow you to tap into more thoughtful responses and maybe think about something that you hadn't been able to get in touch with before because you were a little bit too stressed out. So there's kind of a two-part reason why meditations are really, really effective. Putting you in that space where you can think really effectively is great to start with. And then giving you prompts of things to explore within yourself, also really effective. And you may be thinking, like, how do I find the right prompts? And, like, where do I find the perfect meditation for, like, what I happen to be feeling? Most of them are really generic. And what happens is, like... They're like, you've, 
you've talked to someone and they, they have a question for you and you immediately your, your brain just like checks in and it's like, oh, you have this thing going on. This is the question that you're wondering about. And like, it's just, it's like a leading exercise and it allows you to kind of tap into your own thoughts is the way that that works. Um, you're talking about like a headspace app. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, headspace is good also just for mindfulness in general, which allows us to recognize what we're feeling a lot better, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, explaining more about the ins and outs of these methods, you know, would take more time than I unfortunately have. But uh, at the end of the slides, there is an email newsletter if you guys want to hear from me more. I send out stuff like every other week on, on this if you have questions or um, you want to try it. So, um, okay, quick survey. How many emotions can the average adult identify themselves experiencing? What do you think? Two. <laughs> Close. Five. Like simultaneously or overall? Just in general. Eight. A little high. I'm not perfect. You're not. <laughs> Neither am I. Uh, three is the answer. Happy, sad, pissed off. So. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what we have. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a little bit of a problem because depending on who you ask, there is somewhere between 30 to 50 of them. Here's an emotion wheel if you've never seen one before. If you've been to therapy, you've probably seen this. That's way more than eight. <laughs> way more than eight, yeah. Um, there's a lot of them here. And they, they nicely group them into the ones that we um, have a little more familiarity with. So if you wanted to try and figure out what you're feeling, you can kind of roll down that list. Um, this is an emotion wheel, I did not make it. It's something that exists all over the internet. You can just search emotion wheel and the next time you're feeling something hard, I actually recommend that you do because understanding, you know, when we're angry, if we're feeling resentful about something, or if we're feeling frustrated about something can have two like very different tackling uh, methods for kind of working through that and understanding what comes next. So being able to articulate what you're truly feeling versus just a I'm mad <laughs> sort of situation can be really, really helpful. Um, yeah, so feel free to look one of those up. They're everywhere and they're, they're really helpful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fear and imposter syndrome because I think that they're pretty prevalent. Um, who here is a little bit concerned about the way AI is going to affect our jobs? Yeah, a little bit, right? A little bit. Why do you think that it's scary? I don't want the bots to kill us. <laughs> That's a good point. I don't want them to kill us either. Though I guess if I'm dead, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> No, but like, what's scary about it? What's scary about AI? Things in our industry change all the time. What is scary about this? Everything you've done for the past 17 years will be irrelevant. Oh, you, you feel, you sound really certain about that. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I don't feel irrelevant. I think the automation piece of it and maybe the assumption that it's error proof. Okay, yeah. I'm not as worried about the automation as I'm worried about the error. And the, and the contribution it, that we risk that it's going to make to further disinformation. Because garbage in equals garbage out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't so argue with that. I'm more worried about that than... I'm also concerned about... Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, also, um, general AI freaks me out. The, general, the generative stuff that is going on right now, no problem, but... Mm -hmm. Well, little problems, but... The, the <laughs> no AI, problem. The general AI is probably going to show up sooner than we expect, and that's a concern. I was going to say, I think also the people who run the companies, do the hiring and stuff, making the decisions based on what they might not fully understand to potentially replace people who can do the work and do the job. That, yeah. That's kind of a scary situation because then you just have people replacing us with automated things that don't necessarily they fully understand it. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of unknowns there. I think it creates, or will create, an interesting like cyclical issue where you need people to learn all the basic things, but if we're using AI to learn the basic things, then how is anybody ever going to get to the part to learn to solve the hard things that AI potentially cannot solve yet? Yeah. And so then all of a sudden you lose all of your baseline skills, which loses your whole development pipeline to get to being really good developers, and you have a very serious problem. Yeah. Yeah, there's a skill issue there, right? Like, if everything is done for us, why would we ever learn how to do it? We've seen that with even <laughs> writing. <laughs> That's my job. I want you to feel things. No. Um, I think the scary part of AI is that nobody knows what's going to happen with it, right? We don't know what's coming next. We have no idea how effective it's going to be at doing the things that we do, um, how it's going to affect where our jobs are in a few years. And our brains really, really, really don't like that. Um, we don't like not having the full story. It makes us really uncomfortable. Um, little fact about brains is that they are wired for story. It's the reason I started this conversation off with a story to help you connect into what we were talking about today. And not only do they love hearing stories, but our brains actually really love making them up too. Um, so when your brain has only like five pieces of a 20 piece puzzle, it'll do this really amazing thing where it will just put them all together and you'll have like half root, half space, half cats. But as long as you've completed a puzzle, your brain's going to give you that little piece of dopamine. And it's going to be like, yeah, you figured it out. You got it. Nice job. Uh, so, I mean, what do we call like a story that's based on limited data, imagined data, and it's blended into like something coherent and emotionally satisfying. Pretty much we call it a conspiracy theory. Like, <laughs> we, call it, we call it, you know, you're crazy, you're a loony. Um, our brain's doing that for us all the time. Anytime that you don't have the full story about something, uh, you bump into a colleague and you have a short interaction and you say, they mad at me? Did I do something wrong there? You're just, you're making it up, right? You don't know. Like, maybe they just got off the phone with their grandmother and she's super sick. But you don't know that because you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. Your brain's going to fill in that puzzle no matter what. And you're going to come up with something. And it's going to say, yeah, that makes sense. You did it. Dopamine. Enjoy. Um, I'll give you a super quick example of this. I am really blessed to have a sister that works at the agency with me. She works for me. And I love having her. She's more involved in my life. It's really great. It's been a dream come true. But the flip side of that is that I have to navigate being my sister's boss. And every once in a while, I will ask her to do something on Slack, and she will hit me back with, okay, period. <laughs> yeah. So my brain, when that happens, says, oh, God, I just asked her to do too many things. She thinks that I'm super needy. She thinks I'm being a huge bitch. Like, <laughs> there's all of these stories that kind of pop into my head in that scenario, and I have to navigate that because those are feelings that come up for me, right? That's insecurity for me. I'm asking for too much. Um, those are those like negative experiences that we were talking about earlier when I start to feel uh, that kind of response. So there's a couple of ways that I can tackle this. Um, one of them is journaling. Uh, so I can write it down. And if I wrote on a piece of paper, I asked my sister to send a contract and she replied with okay period. She hates me and she thinks I'm being a baby and I asked her to do too much for me. And then I read that to myself. I'm going to be like, yeah, probably not. So <laughs> we can we can move on from that one. Um, but the other option I have, and this is my preferred option and the way I actually handled this when it happened in real life, is that I can speak directly to the person that I'm confused about. That depends on if you have a good per relationship with this person, right? Like that's not always available to us, so journaling can be a good option. But I just went to her and I said, you know, you hit me with a one word answer. I'm feeling a little bit like, did I do something wrong? Have I crossed the line here? Is that accurate? Am I way off base? And she tells me, no, I'm super busy. I have two kids and I'm in school and I just didn't have time to get back to you. So I hate you with an okay. <laughs> it's not about you. It's almost never about you. <laughs> but um, that approach is amazing. If you have a good relationship with the person, it's amazing for two reasons. Number one, you're going to know 100% for certain the outcome of that conversation. And like, you know, with journaling, maybe you have a little bit of ambiguity there. Maybe you're not 100% sure with your conclusion. When you ask the person if they're mad at you and they say no, 
hopefully they didn't lie to you. You're good. Yeah, yeah you're not um, but maybe. <laughs> but the other thing that's great about that is what if I was right? I opened up that conversation and now we can solve it. So those are two ways you can work through that. Um, you know, I could have gone through a meditation there if I didn't know what was going on, but I knew what was going on. So that wasn't really the right tool for the job. And these methods is like, that's how we address those underlying fears. Those fears pop up day to day, small interactions. That was the tiniest part of my day, but it, it has the potential if I don't address it to build a resentment, it could build into something that does deteriorate a working relationship between my sister and I, and effectively could have an effect on the way I run my company and the way that we get things done. So, you know, in careful consideration, we should fact check all of our conspiracy theories is what I'm telling you. And imposter syndrome, to come back to that, is honestly just another one of those conspiracy theory fears that kind of creeps up on us. It's a little bit more brutal of one, but um, it's the same thing. It's a rooted insecurity. And my best advice, if anyone in here is still experiencing imposter syndrome and struggling with that, which I think we all do at one point or another, um, try a journaling exercise and then read it as if your best friend wrote it about themselves and respond to yourself like you're your best friend. Because you wouldn't tell your best friend, oh, you should have figured that out by now. <laughs> you would tell your best friend that they're learning something, that they're doing an effective job, that they're showing up the best way they can. And that's really all that you can expect from yourself at the end of the day. And I realize that that doesn't fix everything, but I think it's a solid place to start if that's something that you're working through. Um, Remind yourself that everybody has, a, has an imposter syndrome is very powerful because yeah. um, it's not just junior developers or senior developers. No, it's, it's not. CEOs, CMOs, yep. leadership team. Cross industry, cross, cross position. Yeah. Every single person that I've ever talked to has said, um, I experienced this. And go. Oh, no, this, we're under just gentle under here at the time. This is my last slide. Perfect. I have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so, you know, hopefully we've, like, established today that we make some decisions in our body. We've got some old brain stuff that we're working with. Uh, feelings are important. I came here to share with you, like, hopes that you will allow your own reflections. You will find more happiness in your own careers. Find a little more connection to what you're doing. We all spend so much of our lives working. Uh, it would really be a shame if we all felt like I did at the beginning of it for the entire duration. So, um... You know, opening yourself up to this sort of reflection, you may find that creating happiness requires you to make a big change. And when we're encountering a point of change in our lives, this can be really hard. Um, our brain typically throws up a lot of red flags when we want to make big changes. And the last message I want to leave you with is that you can for sure do it. That's all. Um, even if your mind wants to tell you otherwise, your instincts for change are usually right. And there's going to be a little bit of fear that you can work through with some of the methods we talked about earlier. You can, again, stay in touch with me and I'll share more of them with you in a newsletter. But um, stabilizing your nervous system, working through those reflections, getting in touch with what you want to do is exactly what needs to happen for you to create the changes and the adjustments that lead to a happier working life for you. And that's what I really want for every single person in this room. Um, we are all creative, whole, resourceful people. And I hope that what I shared with you today will help you become the fullest form of a human that you possibly can be because we all need someone just like you. So thank you very much. Any questions or anything? Comments? You mentioned your newsletter. Is this a yeah, there's a QR code right here or you can just go to projectcuriosity.co. I send out a newsletter usually every other week, but to be honest with you, it could just happen anytime. You know, so I've also heard that imposter syndrome never truly goes away if like he's commenting it's at all levels. Yeah. I just want to say my first time at Drupal Camp was like 14 years ago here at Florida Camp, and today I still feel the same way I did. <laughs> it's real. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about working through negative stuff today. I also have, if you sign up, you want to learn more, if, you, if this stuff speaks to you, um, there are more positive ways of working through those things too. Like, uh, you can create connections in yourself and like acknowledgements. We sort of call them mantras, which can make people feel weird about it. But 
a fact that you know is true. I have been doing Drupal for 14 years. I am qualified to be here. I know what's going on. Like saying those things to yourself and like reminding yourself of them in moments when things get hard, it, it's actually effective. Um, the things that you say in your brain have a way bigger effect on you than you realize and allowing yourself to have like negative thoughts and not rewriting them as positive ones can be really powerful. Yeah, just last week I was having a really, really bad time and I just found something on um, Spotify, like positive affirmation stuff. So yeah. I sit down and just listen to it while It works. Working. It works. Yeah. It works especially if it's something you can connect with. Everyone connects with things a little bit differently. Sometimes I will turn on, to be transparent, one of those videos and I'm like, this sounds like bitch. <laughs> and I just like cannot connect with it. Um, and then other times I'll turn one on and I can really feel it. Um, music can also be super powerful. There's like... Uh, some some people who put out like really affirming music, positive vibes overall. Like some people find that a little bit more powerful to listen to it via song. Um, or you know you can. Some people say stuff to themselves in the mirror. Some people just have thoughts that they try to return to, or they like write them down, or have like a little um, token that's like a reminder of something. That can all that can all work. Uh, but reframing your negative thoughts into positive ones is important. Talk to yourself kindly. Um, it's it makes a big difference. Don't say I can't say how can I. And <laughs> a, a hack that I've kind of found in my experience is like that that example you gave of like you know your front end is is crappy or whatever is um, tuning into the curiosity. If if I can if I can get a question in to get specific specific problems said yeah. to me. Then it no longer feels like an attack. It feels more like, ah, here's a problem. Here's my next problem to work on. Yeah. And it totally like shifts my focus so that I, I no longer like am. It's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's more of like another logical exercise for me to get into rather than me feeling attacked. Yeah. And that's so much more productive, right? Because now you're you've got something to do with it. And it's like you were saying earlier, if you're if you're blaming somebody or if I'm looking around the room and I'm picking apart what other people are doing. I'm feeling a little self-righteous. I know that there's something wrong with me. Because I don't feel that way usually. I'm a really nice person. I like everybody. I support everybody. So if I start feeling like I need to push myself up, then I know I'm feeling down. Then something is wrong, right? Like there's lots of these things. And learning what it is for you um, is really powerful because then you can start tapping in and you can be that. I mean, everybody wants to be a better human. Everybody wants to show up better. And I think finding your signals um, is a great way to do that. So yeah. The thing that Ted Lasso said was, be curious, not judgmental. And I think yeah. that goes exactly yeah. to what you said about feel attacked, maybe you're going to be judgmental, rather be curious. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Well, you guys have been great. Uh, thank, thank you guys you. so much. Thank you. Thank you.